Today is October 20th, International Sloth Day, and sloths are some amazing creatures that I want to tell you a little bit about. But to start, we're going to get scientific. To start, this is the first branch of their tree, the cingulata, or armored animals. In this branch, you're going to find armadillos, which may be coming as a surprise as far as relatives go. So in these branches, we have the long-nosed armadillo, the sadly deceased pampatheridae, and what I'm going to call hairy armadillos, or armadillos that have fur or hair on them. In the second branch here are the pelosa, or placental animals. This branch is shared with sloths and anteaters. Anteaters are pretty close cousins to sloths, as it turns out. And there are two, roughly two different kinds. There's silky anteaters, which actually look pretty similar to sloths, and what I'm going to call a standard anteater, which is what we usually expect when we think of an anteater, right? A medium to large animal with a really long snout and those kind of feathery tails. That's also in this branch. In this first branch of sloths, we're going to see three different kinds, the Megatheridae, Nothrotheridae, and Brapodidae. These are, well, two of them are sadly extinct. These include ground sloths and oceanic sloths, but also are still existent three-toed sloth today. And in our last branch of sloth, we're going to get two different kinds, which is the Milodontidae and Megalonychidae. Now, this is our two-toed sloths, and also some really interesting cousins of theirs. But overall, these are the Xenarthra. This is the super order of sloth. What's most recognizable about the Xenarthra is the curved claws and really strong forelimbs. Now, for armadillos and anteaters, this really comes in handy because they're digging around for their food. But for sloths, they've adapted this. Ancient sloths, as we'll kind of get into, mostly spent their time on the ground, so they were probably digging up their food. But modern day sloths have actually adapted this to help them climb and hang in the trees. It's pretty interesting to see how evolution can really bring about a different kind of creature from what it initially started as. But now I want to talk about modern day versus ancient sloths because they're pretty different. Now let's first talk about what we definitely know about modern sloths. Modern sloths are about 5 to 25 pounds. They can get about 27 inches long. They hang from the trees and can't walk, actually. Um, I know there are some videos around that show sloths on the ground, and they kind of do this crawling action, right? They pull themselves forward, but they can't actually walk on all four legs. They live in Central. And they are are boreal, which means that they live up in the trees primarily. Now, comparatively, ancient sloths get up to about four tons. Now, that's a pretty big animal, and I don't think it would surprise you with that information that ancient sloths could get up to the size of a modern-day elephant. They could be about 20 feet in length from head to tail, and they could actually stand 
they could be about 12 feet standing, which is about the height of a, uh, an elephant, which is about 11 to 12 feet on average. Now, these creatures were enormous, and in order to, cr to support their weight, they actually used a tripod tail to maintain it. This looks nothing like a sloth, but you get the idea. Now, these creatures actually had skeletons or fossils, if you will, that were found all the way up to Alaska, which is much further than their modern day cousins would actually ever be able to get to since they can't actually stand the cold. Now, what's really interesting about the fact that they made it that far north is that there was actually a species of sloth, ancient sloth, that was discovered by Thomas Jefferson, the Megalonyx jeffersoni. Now, this was a giant sloth, and Thomas Jefferson found one of its claws. He actually mistook it for a giant lion instead of a sloth. But once they figured out what it was, he was so intrigued by these giant sloths that when he sent people over into the Midwest to do reconnaissance missions, if you will, he actually requested that they look for these giant sloths because he was so intrigued by these creatures. And lastly, ancient sloths were mostly grounded they, uh, they didn't really make it up into the trees very much, except for the rare breed that was actually semi-aquatic. And this was known as the Phallus Ocnus. Phallus Ocnus. Phallus Ocnus. <laughs> Which is spelled T-H-A-A-L T-H-A-L-A S S O C A E S. Now, that's a far cry from our sloths nowadays that live up in the trees that are arboreal, but these sloths actually love to swim. They did maintain some of their ancient relatives' love for the water. Now, these ancient creatures that loved the water so much were really fascinating because they used those hooked claws and those strong forelimbs to hook themselves into rocks underwater and anchor themselves in place so that they could meet, eat marine algae. So they actually had a pretty similar diet as well to modern sloths who primarily feed on leaves and other tree byproduct, um, but have been known actually to eat insects, small reptiles, and birds to supplement their diet. Um, one thing actually that ancient sloths do not share with modern day sloths, but do share with their cousins. Armadillo, actually. Is the armory. Actually, ancient sloths were found to have some armored back, shoulder, and neck plates that protected them from predators. Now, this is where we can really see the relation to armadillos. It's really difficult to see between modern day sloths and modern day armadillos, but there is in fact a connection there. Now, with our modern day sloths, there's actually a pretty significant difference going on between the two. So currently there are six species of sloth in, in existence. And they are made up of two families. The first is Bradypus, which is the three-toed sloths. And the second is the Golipus, or two-toed. Now, in Bradypus, there are four different kinds. There's pygmy, there's maned, tail-throated, and brown-throated. Now, the three-toed sloths are recognizable by their really distinctive eye features. Not all of them have it, but most of them do. That's why they're most often recognized. And of course, they have three claws. 
on each limb. Um, now, of the Calypus, there are only two. There's the Linnaeus, this is Sloth, and Hoffman's Sloth. Um, now, these guys are a little bit different. They look a little bit different in that they've got no really distinctive eye features, but they do have uh, most of the time these pink noses. And then of course they've got their uh, two claws on each hand. Now what's really interesting about these two is even though they're the last two families of sloth in existence, they're actually not that closely related. And to talk about that a little bit more, I want to bring up the, uh, the chart, the sloth chart from before. Now, as we can see from here, there were, in the main scheme of things, about five families of sloth. Of those five, only two are in existence today, right? We had the Megatheridae, which were the really enormous ground sloths, the Nothrotheridae, which um, had a few of those ocean species of sloth, or the ones that like to get into the ocean and eat. Uh, they, we have the Brapodidae, which is our current three-toed sloth family. Uh, the Myelodontite, which was um, closely related to our Megalonychidae, which is our two-toed sloth. Now, as we can see from here, even though they're in the same family tree, our two-toed and our three-toed sloth have a pretty significant, you know, distance between them in the branches. Well, the reason for that is their last common ancestor was between 21 and 30 million years ago. That's pretty significant in the grand scheme of things. And that brings up a really interesting question. If they're separated by so much time, how is it that they both evolved to hang upside down on the trees? Because these other branches, all of the fossils that we found, none of them show any evidence of hanging upside down on the tree. Now, they may have gone up there every once in a while, but they were all ground sloths with the occasional dip in the ocean. So what is it about hanging upside down that is so evolutionary, evolutionarily practical that both of these types of sloth ended up that way. Hanging upside down does seem to have some sort of benefit for sloths, especially since that's a pretty unique trait to them. And in fact, it does do one important thing. It helps them conserve energy. Now, to no one's surprise, sloths are incredibly slow creatures. They have a very slow metabolism, and as such, they need to conserve a lot of energy. To do so, they balance on the underside of branches, which obviously, to them, conserves a lot more energy versus balancing on the top of a branch. I mean, these creatures are so slow. Algae, bugs, and moss all grow on their coat, which does have some of, sort of a benefit, camouflage. But these creatures are so insistent on conserving energy that they found a different way of getting around compared to most of the other animals in their kingdom. So the only other ones that do share this are their cousins, which are the silky anteaters. But evidently they haven't really made that as much of a lifestyle for them. So it is really interesting. Two-toed and three-toed sloths, despite there being no ancient sloth evidence of hanging upside down on the trees have found this to be very beneficial. Now, this movement 
is really interesting for one other reason. They have several gates or ways that they get around. And there's three that are kind of distinctive, at least that I want to talk about. There's exploratory, there's traveling, and lastly, there's a diagonal couplet. Now, to give you an idea of each one of these, exploratory is very similar to if you take a dog to a dog park and they go around the whole park with their nose to the ground really trying to figure out what's been going on there. Sloths are very similar. An exploratory gait will get them nice and close to the branch with their nose to it so that they can sniff out and figure out what's been happening there. The traveling gait is what you might see in creatures that are trying to get somewhere, otherwise known as running, which is a foreign concept to sloths, except for when they're trying to escape from predators or just trying to get somewhere exceptionally fast. The traveling gait uh, elongates their limbs as far as they can get them to really expedite the process. And then the last is the diagonal couplet, which may be more familiar to you than you realize. If you've ever gone out walking and realized that your right arm and your left leg are in sync, that's what a diagonal couplet is. It's your opposing limbs that are in sync moving forward and backward in the same way. Now, these are all really interesting because what this is showing us is that sloths, despite the fact that they hang upside down when they move around, are actually mirroring four-legged animals. The regular movement of those four-legged animals, they're just upside down when they do it. And I guess that gives them a pretty unique perspective.